planet Earth is a complicated system involving countless interactions among the geosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere, as well as the biosphere. While we still have much to learn, there's also so very much we have already learned, and that will be our focus here, an introduction to the basics of what we have already learned about Earth's climate. Let's start with temperature. Here's the temperature record going back about a century. This data comes from tens of millions of direct measurements, as well as far more recent satellite observations. Surface temperatures have risen by about 2 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 1 degree Celsius, over the past 100 years. This is significant, but I'm afraid it's just a drop in the bucket. The oceans are about 270 times more massive than the atmosphere. Furthermore, the oceans are primarily water, which, as discussed in another chapter, has a high specific heat. This means the water has the capacity to absorb a lot of heat for relatively small temperature change. This helps to moderate the surrounding atmosphere. If it weren't for the oceans, the rise in temperature in the atmosphere would be much more pronounced. So, three cheers for our ocean's ability to absorb any extra heat. But it's not like that heat just disappears. This graphic shows the increase in the heat content of the oceans over the past 50 years. This is definitely trending upward, which is in line with the rising surface temperatures. But it also represents a tremendous amount of thermal inertia. Now, what do I mean by that? Think of a train of hundreds of cars loaded with coal. How difficult might it be for that train to come to a quick stop? The answer is very. It has a lot of inertia, which means it's difficult to change what it's doing. This is to say, there's no way our atmosphere could suddenly and quickly cool back down. If it did, it would be warmed right back up by all the stored energy within the oceans. It's important to note that about 90% of all additional energy added to our planet is absorbed by the oceans. It's only that remaining 10% that increases the temperature of the atmosphere. The rise in the atmosphere's temperature over the past century may only be 1 degree Celsius. But what the atmosphere does is only a tiny fraction of what's happening to the ocean. An iceberg might not look very large from the surface, but you're looking at just the tip, which you know represents a much larger amount hidden below. This apparently minor one degree increase in temperature tells us that the oceans have just absorbed a heck of a lot of energy from somewhere. So when you hear scientists concerned about another one degree increase for the atmosphere in the coming years, they're worried because they also understand what this means will have just happened to the oceans. You should also note that as the oceans warm, they expand, resulting in a rising sea level. This too has been tracked. As shown here, the average sea level has gone up by about 8 inches over the past century. What about temperatures of the distant past? We can get that from a variety of means, most notably by studying isotopes. Iso what? I'm assuming you know or will soon be learning about such concepts as specific heat and isotopes. So what you're seeing here is the application of these concepts. Briefly, two atoms of the same element but with a different number of neutrons are isotopes of each other. There's the hydrogen atom with only one proton and no neutrons. This is the most common isotope of hydrogen. Let's call it H1 or protium. Then there's the hydrogen atom with one proton and one neutron. Chemically, it's the same type of atom, which is a hydrogen atom, but twice as heavy. Let's call it H2, or deuterium. Most all water is H2O, but one out of every 3,200 water molecules is HOD, where the D is for deuterium. Let's call this heavy water. Because of its greater mass, this heavy water molecule doesn't evaporate as readily as a regular lighter water molecule. With warmer temperatures, however, this mass effect is overcome. So what happens is this. With warmer temperatures, you'll find a greater ratio of heavy water to light water. With colder temperatures, there's a lower ratio of heavy water to light water. This is to say, 
we can quantitate past temperatures by knowing the ratio of heavy to light water. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could get hold of a sample of ancient air? We could then measure this ratio, which would give us an indication of the past temperatures of that ancient air. Well, we have exactly that in glaciers, within which are trapped tiny bubbles of ancient air. Scientists extract cores. The deeper the core, the more ancient the air. The ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica are prime spots for collecting such ice cores. Using this technique, along with others, we get a historical record of temperatures extending to about 400,000 years ago, and in some places as far back as 800,000 years ago. Within that ancient air, you'll also find ancient atmospheric carbon dioxide, whose levels can also be directly measured. What we find is a very clear correlation between past temperatures and past levels of carbon dioxide. Now, what could possibly be the relationship between global temperatures and levels of carbon dioxide? Let's explore this in the next lesson. Good chemistry to you. Mm -hmm.